Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rust Station with Sohail. Today, we're going to do problem 16 from section 6 of chapter 3 of the 10th edition of Boyce and Prima. We want to solve the sec second order linear non homogeneous differential equation given to us in equation 1 that 1 minus t times y prime prime plus t times y prime minus y equals 2 times t minus 1 squared times e to the negative t. We want to solve it on the interval t between 0 and 1. And we want to solve it using the method of variation of parameters. So for the method of variation of parameters, we have to be given the complementary solutions to this differential equation. So we are given that y1 of t equals e to the t, and y2 of t equals t are those solutions. And sure enough, we can see that if I plug in e to the t or t into the left-hand side of equation 1, then the result will be 0. So they do solve the corresponding homogeneous equation. Now, I'm going to uh, go through the procedure of variation of parameters in full detail, but it should be noted that this isn't something you have to do. The textbook does actually summarize the results of the procedure and just gives you a formula that you can use when you're given the complementary solutions and you want to find a particular solution. So let's take a quick look at that. We see here in theorem 3.6.1 of the 10th edition of Boyce and the Prima, we have the second order linear differential equation, y prime prime plus p of t times y prime plus q of t equals g of t, where uh, you're assuming that p, q, and t are continuous on whatever interval that you're working on. Then, the summary of doing all the work from the variation of parameters procedure is this equation 28, where capital Y of T, the or a particular solution, is given by this large expression. And W is the Ronskian of the two complementary solutions, Y1 and Y2, that we were given or that we may have found. The only thing to be careful about when applying this formula is to remember that the differential equation that they are using in the statement of the theorem, it starts with one times y prime prime. They normalized it and made the leading coefficient one. And then if it is normalized, you can go ahead and just apply this formula that they give you. So if, if we wanted to apply the formula, to problem 16, then we would just have to divide by this 1 minus t. And luckily, after dividing by that, everything, all those coefficients would still be continuous since t is between 0 and 1. And then we could go ahead and apply the formula. However, as I said earlier, I don't want to do that today. I want to just work it out in detail using the method of variation of parameters. So. How does this method work? Well, we first assume that our particular solution, y of t, is of the following form. u1 of t times y1 of t plus u2 of t times y2 of t, where y1 and y2 are the complementary solutions that they gave us in the beginning. And u1 and u2 are functions that we want to solve for in order to make this combination a solution. For this particular problem, we already know that y1 of t is e to the t and y2 of t is t, so we go ahead and plug those in and we see that y of t is going to be equal to e to the t times u1 of t plus t times u2 of t. Now, uh, in order to find out what u1 and u2 are, 
we want to make use of equation one. We want to plug everything back into there to get a hopefully simpler differential equation with u1 and or u2. And then we can solve that to get the u's. And once we have the u's, we will have our y. So before we can plug everything in, we did get the y, but now we also need to get the y prime and the y prime prime so we can be prepared to put everything in. So to get y prime, I just go ahead and use the product rule. And we just see that here, the first two terms are the derivative of e to the t times u1 of t, where I have first term times derivative of the second term plus derivative of the first term times the second term. And similarly, the third and fourth terms are the derivative of the second term in yellow, the t times u2 of t. Sure enough, we see we have here first term times derivative of the second term plus one, which is the derivative of t, the first term, times the second term, u2 of t. And we see that our expression for y prime is already a little bit complicated, that's four terms. If we were to do this again, to get y prime prime and use some more product rule, there's a good chance that we'll end up with eight terms for y prime prime. That's also uh, quite a bit. So now we're gonna use a trick. This is part of the technique of variation of parameters. We're going to impose this condition. We're going to declare that in addition to picking u1 and u2 to make uh, this y from equation two a solution, we're also going to make sure that u1 prime and u2 prime satisfy this equation four. Namely that e to, e to the t times u1 prime of t plus t times u2 prime of t equals zero. And that's gonna get rid of two of the four terms in our expression, expression for y prime and make it simpler. Now, uh, just to discuss a little why we can assume that this equation four is true or why we can make that happen, we should notice that this relationship that we see in equation four is exactly the same as this relationship here that u1 prime of t equals negative t over e to the t times u2 prime of t. So all I did is uh, rearrange the first equation in four, just using subtraction and division. And the consequence of this is that if I just integrate both sides, I see that u1 of t is the antiderivative of negative t over e to the t times u to prime of t. So in the beginning, we go back here to here in equation two, when I first introduced u1 and u2, I wanted to find y that satisfied equation one. And I had two free parameters. I could pick u1 and u2 to be anything that I want them to be as I try to create a function y that satisfies equation one. So u1 and u2 are both free. Now, what's happened after we started this equation four is that u1 is now going to be determined by u2, as we see here. u1 is this antiderivative involving u2 prime. So now, what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to pick u2 because I can still do anything I want to u2. I can still pick any function I would like for that. So I'll try to be very clever and pick a u2 that will make a y that solves equation one. And as soon as I pick u2, that's going to automatically determine u1 for me. So I still do get, I still have room to work to pick a function to create the correct y. 
I just can pick one function now instead of two functions. But nonetheless, we see that uh, if we go ahead and make use of this equation, then our expression for y prime is going to simplify into the following. And that's much nicer, much more manageable. So now that we have y prime, we go ahead and calculate y prime prime. Just go ahead and take a derivative of everything that we see in y prime. Use product rule for the first term, and we got lucky for the second term, we don't have to use product rule. So our y prime prime only has three terms in it. Usually it's gonna have four if you do all of this, but we got lucky. So now if we go ahead and remember the initial equation that we want to solve, equation seven is exactly the same as equation one. I just rewrote it for our convenience. We can just go ahead and start substituting everything. So there's our y prime prime in the purple. Then the uh, y prime is going to be right there. So that's going to expand out to be all of this stuff. And then our y was here. So that's going to expand to give us everything in there. So after plugging in the expressions that we calculated for y prime prime, y prime, and y, we just uh, gather all like terms and go from there. Now I wanna focus on the U1 and U2s, the ones that don't have derivatives on them, because this is where part of the magic of variation of parameters comes in, or really the reason the technique works. So let's take a look at U1. We see that we have a U1 here. So that's one minus T times E to the T times U1. A U1 here, T E to the T, and then a U1 here, just negative e to the t. So I gather up all of those there, and I have my one minus t times e to the t plus t e to the t minus e to the t. I will do a similar thing for u2. There is no u2 here. There's only u2 prime. There is a u2 here, so that's going to be a t times u2. And then there's a u2 here. So that's negative 1 times t times u2. So if we gather those here, then we get t minus t times u2. And then all those other terms, I just uh, left those. We'll focus on those later after we see how these first terms cancel out. Now, sure enough, we can know this. It's pretty obvious for the u2 that the coefficient is zero, t minus t is certainly zero. And for the u1, we can also see that one minus t times e to the t plus t e to the t minus e to the t is gonna be zero. Well, let's actually take a slightly closer look at this. I can rewrite both of these in the following way. One minus t times the second derivative of e to the t, since the derivative of e to the t is just itself, plus t times the derivative of e to the t minus just e to the t. That's gonna be equal to the first part, right? So all of this is just gonna be equal to that. And then similarly, we can see that this t minus t is the same as one minus t times the second derivative of t because the second derivative of t is zero so that whole one minus t term just goes away plus t times the first derivative of t that's just going to simplify to t minus t now the benefit of writing it in this way 
it, well, not really the benefit. The reason I'm showing you this is to show you why those two terms with the U1 and the U2 disappeared. It will always be the case that they disappear. And the reason is what we see here in the gray green color is this is the result of plugging e to the t into the right hand side of equation seven which is the same as the left hand side of equation one back at the beginning and since e to the t was chosen to make that right hand side zero e to the t is a complementary solution this entire gray green term goes away similarly what we see here for this lime green lime green term is that this is the result of plugging t into the right hand side of equation seven or the left hand side of equation one and t was also one of the complementary solutions so it will go away and become zero so that is why the u1 and the u2 will always go away at the end when you're using the method of variation of parameters and then all that's going to be left over is what we see here in equation 11 some terms involving only the first derivative of u1 not the second deriv derivative and some terms involving only the first derivative of u2 but not the second derivative and we don't have to stop here we can do one more thing if we go back up we remember this uh, assumption that we made which is equivalent to this assumption here that u1 prime is negative t over e to the t u2 prime if we make use of that right here then we can get rid of all of the u1 primes replace them with u2 primes and if I just go ahead and gather up all the terms and simplify, this is just going to turn out to be t minus 1 squared times u2 prime. And if I look at the start and the finish, right, this is the end of the calculations is t minus 1 squared times u2 prime. That will be equal to the beginning of the calculations back here at 7. 2 t minus 1 squared times e to the negative t. If I cancel out the t minus 1 squared, then I just get that u2 prime is 2e to the negative t. If I once again make use of that uh, assumption we made relating u1 prime and u2 prime, we can immediately find u1 prime here as well as negative 2 times t times e to the negative 2t. Now I'll just integrate both of these, both parts of 13, to get that u1 is t e to the negative 2t plus 1 half e to the negative 2t, where I've taken the constant of integration to be 0. And then u2 is going to just be negative 2 e to the negative t, where I once again took the constant of integration to be 0 because I'm just looking for a particular solution. And then if we uh, go ahead and remember how we were constructing y, it remember that y of t is e to the t times u1 of t plus t u2 of t. So all of this stuff is going to correspond to my e to the t times u1 of t. And then the rest of it here is going to correspond to my t times u2 of t. And if I go ahead and simplify, then I see that 1 half minus t times e to the negative t is a solution to the equation that we started with. If we wanted to get the general solution, which is what they asked us for, um, I only gave you a particular solution here. The general solution would just have us add a constant times e to the t plus another constant times t. The 
two complementary solutions that they gave us. You could also get the general solution by just keeping the constants of integration when you calculate U1 and U2. And as long as you have two different constants for those two different integrations, and then you plug it back in to find your Y, you'll end up with the general solution for Y instead of a particular solution. So that's all I have for this problem. If you like the video, give it a like and subscribe.